Thank you for being part of the Oakwood Free Will Baptist Church Ministries. Our prayer is that those who listen to the Word of God will find a greater revelation of God's purpose in their lives. For additional resources, please visit us on the web at www.oakwoodfwb.com. Today, may you be encouraged, strengthened, and refreshed by our message. We're in Second Peter this morning. We're going to be... We're, if you folks know that we started this new series, um, and it is, um, it is from Answers in Genesis, uh, which is, is just, I think, wonderful. Um, and the, this particular quarter, we're looking at uh, the fact that we can trust the Bible. And if you remember, as we talked about how we were going to be studying this curriculum, it, it approaches things from a little bit different perspective from the average Sunday school curriculum. <coughs> Case in point, we're going to learn about apologetics. Uh, we're going to learn about hermeneutics. We're going to learn a lot of different things um, that will help us, not just our own personal knowledge of the Word of God, but the way that this curriculum goes about is it not only teaches you the curriculum, but it teaches you how to teach others. Um, so it helps you to be a better defender of the faith. Threat has been detected. Threat has been detected. All right. Who's? No, I'm just kidding. I think that was a computer. I'll, I'll just let it. I'll let it go. Hopefully, it uh, it will not uh, keep doing that. Okay. <laughs> um, what we're going to be looking at this morning is um, basically it's how to approach the Bible how, when you're when you're going to study the Bible. We're going to look at three different aspects of how we are to approach if we come to a particular passage. And we're going to look at at least three passages. Hopefully we'll get to the fourth one this morning. But what we're going to do is we're going to talk about context. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, when you come into studying the Bible, how that, number one, you ought to observe. Observe the historical context. Observe what was going on in the time. Threat has have been to, detected. I'm going to have to cut this off. Excuse me. talking about we're going to be looking at the fact that when you look at the scriptures that you're going to have to you need to observe what's going on uh, you need to observe who the author is who they're who he's writing to you know all these things are important but also interpretation that's the second thing interpretation is important um, a lot of times when we read the Word of God we say oh well I think it says this or I think it says this and we really already go into it with preconceived notions and we're not reading the Bible and taking the Bible for what it says. We're thinking, all right, I believe this is what it says. And so we go into something already thinking about, well, I think this is what it means. When really we ought to go into studying the Word of God, recognizing that God has one particular meaning in the context. So therefore, I'm going to go in, I'm going to try to wipe my mind blank, and I'm going to go in... And I'm going to study the context. I'm going to study the historical background. I'm going to do everything I can to accurately interpret the Word of God. And then we're going to look at application. Application has to do with, okay, here's what God says. What does it mean to my life? Okay? And really and truly, that's where the rubber meets the road. It is making application of the Word of God. If we're just a hearer of the Word and not a doer only, or not a doer, if we're just a hearer only, we're deceiving ourselves. I mean, so it's important that not only we accurately interpret the Word of God, and that what the Bible tells us that we're to rightly divide the Word of Truth, 2 Timothy talks about, but we're also to apply it to our lives. Yeah, God said, thou shalt not kill. Oh, well, what does that mean for me? It means I need to not kill people. I need to not kill people. I mean, that's just a real crude example. But anyway, um, you see where I'm going with this. All right, so let's look at the first thing, to observe. Well, yeah, let's go ahead and look at this. To observe. What does it mean to observe? It simply means that we are to ask who, what, where, when, and how. 
ask questions, all right? Who is this particular verse talking to? Uh, what is it trying to say? Where was it written? When was it written? You study all of the, the context of, of this particular passage. Who is the author writing to? What words uh, are repeated? What words are emphasized? You know, you start reading the Bible and you say, oh man, it says thou shalt this or thou shalt that over and over and over again. So God really must be trying to emphasize something here, okay? Um, where is the event taking place? What time is it written? What type of literature um, is being used? History, poetry, parable, whatever. What kind of literature is being used here? What is the main point of the passage? You know, a lot of times we read a passage of Scripture and we think, oh, well, maybe this is what it means. And really, it's just one of the lesser themes in that passage rather than getting the whole picture. Um, so it's important that we get, that we observe everything about the passage. I would encourage you guys, when you read a particular passage, read it more than one time. Read it over and over and over again because what's going to happen is things are going to pop out and you're thinking, man, I read that twice already, but I didn't see that. And God begins to reveal things over and over again as you read that over and over. But then there's the word interpret. We look at a passage in light of what the rest of the Word of God says. Sometimes we want to pick and choose. We want to say, oh, well, look what it says over here. And we leave out what the Bible says over here. And you've got to take both of them together to kind of interpret and see what it's trying to say. So you use Bible to interpret Bible, okay? Um, we may identify cross-references, cultural considerations, specific word meanings, context, commentaries. By the way, I love commentaries. I encourage you, if you don't have commentaries, get you some commentaries. It's not just for pastors. Uh, there are layman's commentaries out there that are really, really good. But I want to warn you against something. Do not go to the commentary first, okay? We make mistakes sometimes as we say, oh, well, I'm just going to go right to the commentary and I'm going to read what the commentary says. No, you pick up this book and you read this book. And I'm going to tell you, sometimes it's easy to understand and sometimes it's not. But you do the hard thing and you study it yourself. Then if you get stuck and you're thinking, man, I just don't know what it's saying, then it's okay to go to a commentary. But go to the Word of God first. Don't make it the last resort, all right? Make it the first one. You go to the Word of God. Uh, so there's interpreting. Um, after we have observed what the text says, we've observed the historical context, we've observed all that we can about it, uh, and we've interpreted these ideas, then the next step is to apply the Word of God. And the Scripture is full of God's commands to believers to apply what God has communicated. We're, again, we're to be doers of the word and not just hearers only. This is James chapter 1, verses 21 through 24. Um, when you examine, for instance, the book of 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, you find that the Bible is it's good for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And so the word of God gives us everything that we need, okay, as it pertains to life and godliness. There are specifics sometimes that God may not say. There may not be specifics about a certain issue that you're concerned about, but the principles in the Word of God covers everything. And so God's Word has an answer for every problem that we face. Every life issue that we face, His Word uh, has the answer for it. All right, now we're going to be looking this morning, uh, interpreting uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. And we're going to look at a couple of other passages, but bear with me because I'm going to be asking you questions, okay? And uh, I'm going to get your input and see what you think about these particular passages, okay? 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According to his divine power, hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lusts. So, thinking about this passage, this morning we're going to be looking at an inductive Bible study method. Okay? An inductive Bible study method um, we're going to be looking at since uh, the specific parts 
uh, of the text, we're going to look at the specific parts of the text and then draw a general conclusion from the particulars of the text. Okay? So, as we think about that, uh, we're going to ask some simple questions. And these are questions that you can take in any passage. You can ask these questions in any passage and be able to come up with what is God trying to say here. Okay? Here is one question. Who is writing the letter? Or who is the letter written to? Particularly in this passage, who is writing this letter? Peter. Peter is writing the letter, and who is he writing it to? He's writing it to Christians. Okay? I know it's very simple. It's very elementary. But it will save us a lot of heartache and a lot of headache if we'll simply learn to ask the simple questions. Okay? So Peter is writing the, the epistle, and he's writing a letter to other Christians. We know this because the audience has obtained like precious faith by Christ Jesus. Okay? So we know it's got to be talking about Christians. Okay? Same thing in, in 1 John. Some, I've heard somebody say one time, well, uh, or not 1 John, but Hebrews. Obviously, being frugal Baptist, um, we, we teach the doctrine known as um, uh, apostasy. Okay? I don't preach it very often, but we believe, according to Hebrews 6, 4 through 6, that there is a possibility that someone can't renounce their faith in Christ, leave, and never turn back. Okay? Which, once they leave, they can't turn back. But anyway, here's the thing. There are people in religious circles that will tell you, well, that's not talking about Christians. Well, what does it say? Those who were once enlightened, tasted the heavenly gift, been made partakers of the Holy Spirit. The only people that are made partakers of the Holy Spirit are Christians. Okay? So you've got to read in who the letter's writing to and so forth to be able to get uh, the exact meaning of what God would have. All right, so back to 2 Peter. We found out that Peter is writing the apostle to other believers. But now what form of literature is, is 2 Peter? Um, it is an epistle. It's a letter written to Christians to encourage them and to, to provide doctrinal teaching and correction. Okay? A lot of the Word of God has to do with this, uh, particularly in the New Testament. The epistles give a lot of doctrinal teaching and a lot of doctrinal correction. Okay? Now, is there any phrase, or are there any phrases or words that are repeated in this particular passage in verses 1 through 4? Do you notice any words that are repeated more than once? Or that are, that are mentioned more than once? Okay, knowledge. What else? Two big ones I'm thinking about. God and what? And Jesus Christ. Okay? So you might get the idea, this is, this is really going to focus on God and on Jesus Christ. Okay? So God is the focus of the passage. Um, then what is the historical context of the passage? When, when was it written? It was written in the first century. Okay? I noticed you guys don't have that information right in front of you. So that's the reason I'm giving it to you. It was written in the first century. What commands, promises, or warnings are in this passage? There are no commands or warnings, but there are several promises. What does verse 1 say? What is the promise of verse 1? We have obtained what? Like precious faith for us. We have obtained like precious faith. That is a promise. Those who have come to Christ, we have this precious faith. Verses 3 and 4 talks about uh, the promises we have been given and the knowledge that God allows us to uh, allows us to live godly lives. Okay? What has been given to Christians according to this passage? We have been given all things, what? We've been given all things that pertain to life and godliness. That is, we have the Word of God. He gives us everything we need to know how to live for Him, to know how to how to, uh, to live a life of godliness. He's given us everything that we need for this. You know, we continue to ask a lot of questions about the text in order to understand it, uh, in order to understand the passage, but we're going to move on in this process for just a few minutes. The next step, now that you've made observation, you understand who it's written to, you understand where, it, uh, where it's going to, you understand the historical context, you know when it was written, you know all these important things, you know what the focal passage or parts of the passage is, you know really where it's focusing on, it's focusing on God, okay? Now you start interpreting. 
All right, so you start interpreting and then how to apply it to our lives. The interpretation process will help understand the passage in light of the rest of Scripture and then to identify the main idea of the passage. And so verse 3 uses two pronouns. To whom are the pronouns referring to? His, him, who. They all refer back to God, okay? The Father and Jesus in verses 1 and 2. In verse 3, we see that God's divine power is the source of all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him. This raises the question of how can we, how can we know about God so that we might understand those things that are mentioned. To understand what this means, we might ask the following questions. Number one, how do we find the knowledge of Him? How do we find the knowledge of God? How do we do that? How do we know? How do we find out who God is? How do we find out what God's like? You get into what? The Bible. It's very simple. God is not going to open up your head and pour in His divine knowledge. You've got to get in the book. You've got to read the book. That is how we're able to find out the knowledge of Him. Okay? So we get in the Word of God. You know, I would love to be able to say, man, I can get the Word of God by osmosis. I can put it up on my head it's, they're right there close. I can feel the Word of God, and God just poured in. Okay, that ain't going to happen, is it? It's not going to happen. You've got to sometimes do the difficult thing, and sometimes reading the Word of God is not easy. It's not. Because you're thinking, what does this mean? I, you know, and, and sometimes I have to pray and say, Lord, I need the Holy Spirit to teach me what this Word is trying to say. And so we need to make sure that we are getting in the Word of God so that we will find the knowledge of Him. Okay, God has revealed Himself in the pages of this book. It is supernatural revelation. And so we get in the book and let the book get in us. And the book changes us as the Spirit of God convinces us that this is truth and that the Spirit of God convicts us of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And we change our lives accordingly. So thinking about the knowledge of Him... A uh, couple more questions we're going to ask, and that is, based on this little bit of observation and the interpretation of this particular passage that we just looked at, what is the main theme that we can draw from the passage? Uh, the main theme that we're looking at is that we can understand how that we are to live our lives in light of what God has revealed to us in Scripture, and we'll support the idea as we look at the next two passages that we're going to be looking at in just a minute. So. The whole idea of this passage is that we can understand how to live our lives in light of what God has revealed to us in Scripture. Remember, the focus is on God, but also the fact that God's going to help us as we read the Word of God, as we study the Word of God, we will learn of Him and all that pertains into life and godliness. How do we live our lives for Him? It's found in the book. It's very simple. It's really simple when you think about it, but there are people out there that go into it and study the Word of God, and they will pick a word here and a word there, and they'll say, oh, this is what God's trying to say. When you've got to take it in the context that it's written in, okay? Now, Hebrews chapter 4. Go ahead and turn there. Hebrews chapter 4. I'm going to flip back. Hebrews chapter 4. And we're going to read verses 11 through 13. Beginning in verse 11. Let us therefore labor, I'm sorry, let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same manner, uh, the same example of unbelief. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of the asunder of the soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him uh, with whom we have to do. Okay? So we'll stop reading right there. In this passage, we're going to be looking at two more aspects of this inductive Bible study method. It is in the previous passage, we talked about the three uh, basic parts of the method as we observe, observe, interpret, and then um, you're going to apply it. And so um, 
Many people say as they read the Bible literally, that they read the Bible literally, but we have to be careful with that idea. When people outside the church hear the phrase, they often use to mock Christians, so we need to explain the idea better. Jesus referred to himself as a door in John chapter 10, verse 7, but we don't think that he means a literal door. I mean, Jesus is not a literal door that you would open up like we open up that door. <coughs> But what it's talking about is Jesus is the door of salvation. He is the way that we get salvation, okay? And so it's a figure of speech. So when you read the Word of God, sometimes you have figures of speech in there. Um, so it's important. For instance, in this passage, uh, it says that the Word of God is a sword. Well, the Word of God, I mean, I can't take the Word of God and pierce that right there. It's not a sword, all right? But it is a sword, and the fact that it pierces our soul with truth, okay? And so there are some times when we read a passage that uh, we've got to understand that there are, um, there are these figures of speech used as well. When you look at verse 12, what does verse 12 use the phrase, the Word of God to describe? Okay, it's quick and powerful. Um, the phrase means it's simply more than just a single word spoken by God. It is commonly used to refer to the complete revelation of God through history, the Bible. Okay? Um, is there any other passage of Scripture that can help understand what that phrase means? Well, you can look up 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, Mark chapter 7, verse 13, Luke chapter 4, and verse 4, or John chapter 10 and verse 35. And there are many passages that are very similar to this, they use to describe the revelation of God. And so if you've got cross-references in your Bible, you can look at different passages that will help you to better understand what it's talking about. When you look back at verse 12, the Word of God is used to describe, and Gabby already said it, living, it's powerful, it's sharp. These are all things that the Word of God is used to be able to describe the Word of God. Can you look back to those verses? Yes, ma'am. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 13, Mark chapter 7, verse 13, Luke chapter 4, verse 4, and John chapter 10, verse 35. Okay? So when you look at these parallel passages, it helps you to better understand this particular passage. When you look back at verse 12, it refers to the Word of God as living, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Does the writer of Hebrews intend for us to think that he's talking about a literal sword? No, he does not. Okay? It is a phrase, it's a metaphor that is used um, in, in, to give us a sense that the Word of God is sharp to us, to our spirit, to our soul. Okay? And it, it will speak to us as nothing else can. So, are there any other passages in Scripture that compare God's Word to a sword? And Revelation. Okay, Revelations. There's also Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17. Uh, it says that the Word of God, uh, the sword of the Spirit. Uh, there is, yeah, Revelation chapter 1, verse 16, as Miss Dixie was mentioning. Also, Revelation chapter 2 and verse 12. So there's several other passages that refer to God's Word as a sword. But again, when you, when you think about it's not a particular, like a real sword, it is simply God's Word speaks to us. So... When we think about interpretation, it's important that we look at the context. It's important that we interpret the Word of God in the correct way. Now, in light of what we just looked at, what is the main theme of this passage? <clears throat> when you read Hebrews chapter 4, verses 11 through 13, what is, what is the whole passage talking about? About God's Word. About God's Word. The fact that God's Word is the standard for truth. Okay, it's not thus saith Dwayne or thus saith Stanley or anybody else in here. It is what God's Word says. It is the standard of truth that we hold. It's not my opinions, although this world today will tell you it's truth is relative. It's just a matter of what this person says or what this person says. What may be right for you may not be right for this person and also what might be wrong for you may not be wrong for me. It's just whatever we feel is right or wrong. What good, what's good is evil and what evil is good. And that is pretty much where we're at today. Um, the Bible even talks about, you know, in the, in the last days that people will go away from truth. And uh, so, and to be honest with you, when you read Romans chapter 1, it talks about 
that man has now began to worship and serve the creature more than the creator. Man has put himself in the place of God and serves himself rather than God. And so um, we get in a dangerous place, and we, we are there, I believe, in our world today, that where we begin to lift ourselves up as God, that we're the center of everything, you know, that everything revolves around us. And that's where we are today. And it's a sad commentary on the state of our nation and our world, really. We're going to examine another passage. And um, this is 2 Timothy chapter 2. So if you want to flip over to 2 Timothy chapter 2, I've got to get there myself. 2 Timothy chapter 2. By the way, I love uh, any of Pauline's epistles. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 2. You, you folks know that because I've probably preached on the book of Philippians more times than probably any other passage uh, in the Bible. Uh, but anyway, 2 Timothy chapter 2, uh, beginning in verse 14. Notice what it says. 2 Timothy, trying to make sure I'm there right, in the right place. 2 Timothy chapter 2, beginning in verse 14. Of these things, put them in remembrance. Charge them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the uh, subverting of the hearers. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of two, truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their word will eat as doth the canker of whom um, is Ahimnius and Philetus. Philetus, excuse me. And so, verse 18. Who concerning the truth have erred, saying that they have resurrect, that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal: the Lord knoweth them that are His, and let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Okay. So we think about this passage. Who can tell me? First of all, who can tell me the three steps? as you examine the passage. Remember the three steps I told you before? One of them starts with an O. When you go into to trying to understand what a passage means, observe, all right? What's the second step? Apply to our lives. Okay, interpret. interpret. All right, the, the third step would be apply to our lives, okay? So you've got observation, interpretation, and then application, okay? You observe the passage, the context, you interpret based on the context, you say, okay, based on what I already know about this passage and who is written to and who wrote it and all these things, all right, what is it trying to say to me today? And then once you find out what the Bible says, then you make application to your life. Okay, now in this passage, who is the author? Who is it that wrote the book of 2 Timothy? Paul, okay. Who is Paul writing 2 Timothy to? Timothy. He is a young preacher in the Lord, really and truly, Paul kind of came alongside of Timothy and really almost adopted him in the Lord and is trying to help him in his faith because he, Paul knows he's already been through the rough stuff in ministry. And he understands Timothy's getting, you know, he's in it, but he's getting ready to get really involved and he's going to have some hard times. And so Paul's trying to encourage Timothy in the Lord and he's trying to get him to understand the importance of the Word of God and of standing on truth and all those things. And so... Paul's writing it to a young Timothy, but what type of, of literature is being written? This is an epistle, okay? So it is an instruction passage. It's talking about doctrine, encouragement, um, and etc. Depending on the passage, usually the epistles, that's what they're doing, okay? Are there any commands or promises or examples to follow? Or are there sins to avoid? You notice any of those things? Study. Okay. Study. There's a command. Verses 14, 15, and 16, there are commands that are given. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay? So as we think about what the command is, it is to study. Now we know that it was written to Timothy, but it's also written to the church today. That is, the word of God, the truths of God's word are timeless. It's never going to change. What God said back then, God still means today. And so we are to study. 
Every believer is to study the Word of God. Why? Because we want to rightly divide the Word of Truth. We want to rightly interpret Scripture. We don't want to take anything out of context. We don't want to misinterpret something. We don't want to add to or take away. That's a very dangerous territory right there, isn't it? The Bible tells us that he that adds to or takes away, God will take his name out of the book. So we, we want to make sure we rightly divide the Word of Truth. Okay? Very important. Okay? So there, are, there is a command that we are to study. Right? Now, thinking about... Tell you what, let me back up for a second. When you think about, um, for instance, the King James Version, New King James Version, NIV, NASV, ESV, there are a lot of different translations out there. I think we've got to be careful sometimes. I think it's good to do parallels and to say, all right, what is this saying over here? How does What does this particular interpretation say? But, for instance, I'm going to give you an example. In the King James and the New King James, the, the phrase rightly dividing is there. But when you look at other translations, for instance, the, the English Standard Version, it will say uh, rightly handling, right? You really haven't changed any meaning there, okay? Uh, one saying it rightly dividing, the other saying rightly handling, simply means still, still talking about the same thing. The NIV says correctly handling, still nothing wrong with that translation, all right? Uh, there are some things in the NIV that I don't like the way it translates. It also leaves a lot of stuff out. That's why I don't use the NIV, okay? But the, um, the NIV in this particular case says correctly handling. I think that that's pretty good interpretation, okay? Because I think rightly dividing, correctly handling, that's pretty close, all right? But then the NASV says accurately handling the Word of God. So when you, when you have a question about something, whatever translation you're using if you think all right is this really what it's trying to say the best thing to do is go back to the original language okay go back to the original language in this case it would be the Greek and say okay what does this Greek phrase mean what does this Greek word say and there are some helps yes sir uh, there is a thing called an interlinear uh, Greek New Testament okay it has the English up there and the Greek underneath it so it'll, you know what I'm trying to say? In other words, it'll, you can read it in the English as to what it's saying. Um, obviously, not everybody has a Greek interlinear. There, you can get them at Lifeway. Well, because of this, the simple um, ease of it, I guess, if you will. In other words, there are a lot of people that have put a lot of work into translations, and they have really tried to accurately divide the word of truth. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, it's just that the, not everybody knows Greek. Not everybody knows Hebrew. And so we have translations today that will help us. Um, you know, I think it's important, for instance, there are passages even in the King James. When you read... Um, John chapter 6, verse 37. I'll tell you what, let's turn there. because, And I've used this passage before as an example. Uh, look in John 6. Dwayne, another thing about the interlinear is, is the word order. Is yes. Always... And that, thank you for bringing that out, Barry. That is true. Because, for instance, Abe, when, when you're reading a passage in the Greek, it may say, like, if you're going to say, I'm going to church this morning. All right? Well, in the Greek, it may say, to the church I am going. Okay, so it changes things around a little bit. So thank you, Barry, for, for bringing that out. Uh, look at John chapter 6. Okay, verse 37. All the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Okay? Now, so when you read it this way, you think, okay, it's all about God giving me, giving Christ this person, this person, this person. In other words, Salvation is all about God picking and choosing. And there are people that will interpret this passage and say, well, that's what God means, is that God arbitrarily chooses some to be saved, and then some have no choice. They can't be saved. Okay, that's, that's part of uh, John Calvin's doctrine, okay, Calvinism, all right? Now, you can also, as you read the Greek, it also can be translated, all that come to me, the Father gives to me. And him that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. So when you read it 
you, right here you read, you can, you can get the idea that, oh, well, God picks and chooses some to be saved and some not to be. Well, we know from reading other passages that that simply cannot be true. Romans chapter 10, verse 13. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So you interpret Scripture with Scripture. You see what I'm saying? And so when you read this passage, you think, well, man, that can't mean that God chooses Abe to be saved, but He's not going to choose me. Because when you read in the, in the Greek, it can also be translated, all that come to me, the Father gives to me. That is, anybody that comes to Christ, God's given them to it. Okay? So as we think about these things, it is important that when things are not as clear as we would like them to be, you go back and study it for yourself. Go back to the original and study it yourself. Okay? All right. Does that make sense? Okay, so I, I want all of you to go out and buy you a Greek interlinear New Testament, okay? Um, that's actually... Yeah. Amazon. Amazon. And, and to be honest, with you, there, for those of you who go online, there are some online helps as well. You can go to certain websites. I'll tell you, and this is a plug, hopefully I'm not, do, um, I'm not um, breaking any laws by doing this, but in the bell just rang. And I'm not even halfway through the lesson. Um, if you would go to um, CARM, if you ever have questions about things, there is a website. It's called CARM, CARM, Christian Apologetics Research Ministry. Okay? If you ever have any questions, like, and I'm, I'm going to throw this out there. I don't know that they would answer this question, but um, did Adam have a, a navel? Did he have a belly button? I mean, they, they, you can ask, go on their search engine and type questions, and they will give you pretty accurate uh, definition of certain things if you want to go on there. But it's called C-A-R-M. Um, if you have a question about a particular cult, like um, Jehovah's Witness or whatever else you want to put in there, you can go on there and their search engine, and you can ask a question, what do they believe? And it'll pop. It'll have articles right there that you can read. It'll take. It's a really good help. So what I'm saying is there are some online helps as well. Um, you know, any question that you've got, pretty much, you can ask on that website, and they'll help. And they give really good, accurate information. Okay, I wouldn't send you somewhere that didn't. So it's a really good help, study help, if you want to go there. Okay. All right. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this class. God, thank you for each one that rep this represented each family. God, what a blessing that they are to me and, and to this church. And God, we pray you continue to bless them as they seek to do your will, as they seek to rightly divide the word of truth, to study the word of God, um, and Lord, that uh, they would be able to give an answer to every one of the hope that lies within them with meekness and with fear. So God, we commit ourselves to you this morning. Bless us, continue to bless as we worship you today in spirit and truth. And I pray, God, that we would take the things of this world that's on our mind, that we would push it aside, and that we would focus on your eternal word. God, challenge us today, but not only challenge us, but change us for your honor and your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
that's why my 